today I'm your host, Rabbi Kiwanuka. With me is Mr. Where are you? Hamza Matovu. Hamza Matovu from Uganda. From Uganda. So today we are going to explore the gay zone in London. Uh, with us is Steve Peck, who's going to walk us and tell us the history of this area. All right, so um, hello and very warm welcome to this LGBT tour of, of Soho. It's a tour through time because that's exactly what we're doing. We're going back to the 1920s and 30s to the present day. And uh, it's also, um, we're going back to a time when it was illegal uh, to be seen to be gay in the UK. Um, basically, it was in 1885, a law was passed and um, it was difficult to catch out homosexual people so they made a really strict law and um, anyway in 1967 um, the law was, that law was decriminalised. The law only applied to men, it didn't apply to lesbians because the Queen wouldn't sign that bill unless they took that word out. She said women it cannot be lesbians, it, it's impossible. So lesbianism was not acceptable, which is not illegal. Male mm. homosexuality was. Mm. And uh, so anyway, I hope that you enjoy it and um, I hope it gives you some uh, mm. insight into what it was like. First thing I'd like to say is that uh, the idea that 1967, everything was okay after that, it wasn't. It was just a little change in the law. And also, before that, if we're going back a hundred years or so, the gay people were hiding away. Some people were hiding away, some were having a fantastic time because there were lots of bars, there were lots of clubs. They were secret, they were underground, and we're going to discover them today. Okay? Mm. Now, I'm not just going to talk about LGBT things. Mm. I would like to make connections because you might walk around and wonder what things are. I'd like you to look across the road uh, to your left. Mm. Can you see that pub where it says French House? Yeah. Okay. During the Second World War, the French president was a refugee here. His name was Charles de Gaulle. And he used to uh, have meetings in a pub upstairs um, with his top ministers to see how they could take back France. And that's why it's called the French House. Okay. Mm. I'd like you to look across the road to your uh, right. Can you see where it says Golden Lion? Mm. Can you see that? Yeah. That's a very old pub. That is an example of the kind of pub in the 1950s which were gay and which would get raided sometimes. Um, but it was a, a very rough pub, you know, you wouldn't want to go in there. And so, you know, so it was people who didn't mind roughing it. <laughs> but as we shall see, there were different places for different kinds of people. Gay people are not just one kind of people, the whole spectrum and we're going to see a, a, um, a few of those. Mm. So I think what we'll do now, we'll go to our first stop, mm. or you could say we're going to a 24 hour drinking club. Please follow me. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Oh, so it makes more sense to be in a one way system. Yeah. And I just want you to have a look across the road, where I'm pointing now, number 41, where it says duck soup. Can you see that? Okay, number 41. Um, now that, uh, before, was called the Colony Club. It was run by a lesbian called Muriel Belcher, which is quite a good name for a land, uh, pub landlady, isn't it? It was basically, it was a 24-hour drinking club at a time when the licensing laws were very strict. You know, pubs must close at half past 10, at the weekend, 11 o'clock. Uh, as long as they were quiet, police didn't really mind. Now, she was a very strict landlady and she was very straight talking with everybody. You know, she could be very rude. Uh, she said, what every woman wants is to be the queen. And she was the queen of that. It started in 1948. It attracted people who were artists people who were writers, people who were political agitators. 
um, all kind of, what you call very middle class people uh, went there. Now, there was one man called Francis Bacon, and Francis Bacon was an artist, and it's a true story. He was in his house one night, he was going to bed, he heard a noise. He went to see who it was, it was a burglar. And instead of any confrontation, he and the burglar made friends, and the burglar became his boyfriend. Mm. And he brought his boyfriend, George D uh, Dyer, to the Colony Club. And Muriel Belch was happy. She said, oh, you've got me a new, a new customer. She said, every time you bring a new customer to my club, I'll give you a free drink. It's fantastic. Mm. So he, he was bringing more young men and more young men. In the end, it became a gay place, basically. Mm. Now, um, it went on for many years. She was 31 years, a landlady. She died. But it carried on until 2008 when Parliament decided that smoking in public places was banned. So the manager says there's no use running this because we like smoking and drinking. In fact, all the regulars there died of cirrhosis of the liver. Very, very big drinkers indeed. So this brings up a few issues. First of all, when the police said to her, listen, Muriel, just keep your Nancy boys under control, will you? And we'll leave you alone. Would they have said that if they were working class people? The fact that there were people with money, you know, very uh, educated, very uh, uh, people who knew the law, meant they got away with quite a bit. The other thing is that this issue of addiction, of drinking, smoking and drugs amongst the LGBT community, has been something of interest for many years. In fact, um, uh, Stonewall, which is a LGBT campaign and organisation, did a nationwide survey in 2017, published the results in 2018, and they found that uh, the use of um, uh, 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 drugs, uh, 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 tobacco and alcohol amongst the LGBT population was quite much higher than it was amongst the general population. I've not looked at how they collected the information, but if they went to pubs and clubs, then obviously people are bound to be big drinkers. But, so they must have gone and interviewed as many people as they could generally. They made recommendations to the NHS for training for, the, uh, for NHS staff in dealing with uh, LGBT people's specific needs, mental health issues and addiction issues. They also recommended to the NHS, the NHS continued to campaign for the banning of conversion therapy. And on the 30th, no, it was the 23rd of June, I think, that Opal was present um, at Downing Street when a petition, another petition was handed into the Cabinet Office, uh, uh, demanding really that this uh, process of change in people's sexual identity change and people's sexual orientation, that it should be made illegal. So I hope that will be happening. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so we've been to our 24-hour drinking club. Mm. Who would like to come with me to a real brothel? Anybody? Well, if you do, please follow me. Now, I'd like to look at that door, number seven. Mm. Um, before the pandemic, yeah. there was a notice on there saying, this is not a brothel, there are no prostitutes here, because people are always banging on the door. In fact, it's an example of an old brothel which goes back to the 1700s. Now, prostitution was illegal, and um, the Public Morality Council and police have been looking out for places like this. You know? So, uh, people who are involved in the sex trade will have a secret language. Let's say uh, it wouldn't be called prostitution, it would be called French Polish. Hello, darling, fancy a bit of French polish. Yeah. Only a fiver, you know, this, this kind of thing. And the police would not know what they were talking about. This. If our secret language grew up, and eventually a secret language also grew up amongst the LGBT population. Gay men and lesbians would use a secret language to protect themselves. Now, the name of that language was Polari. P O L. A-R-I, Polari. Before 1967 decriminalisation, Polari could be heard a lot. 
And I'm just going to give you some examples of that language now, because we don't hear much of it. Um, so basically, a man was called an Omi, and a woman was called a Polony. So a gay man was an Omi Polony, and a lesbian was a Polony Omi. Now, one very important word in the gay community was this word Vada. Vada meant look out, look out. It was like danger. And one very um, well used one was Vada, Vada. A shopping Omi. Now, a shopping Omi meant a police man. Shopping Polony meant a policewoman. And when people heard that, they would scoff it, you know, they'd get out of the way. Somebody was coming. And uh, we go a little bit more into it. Hmm, Bona Omi. What a good looking man. Bona Polony. What a good looking woman. You see, Bona meant handsome, beautiful, good looking. So, this is a language you don't hear, uh, well, you don't hear it at all, except that recently it's been revived as an academic subject. Mm. Professor Paul Baker at Lancaster University has um, started courses in Polari, and they're very popular with gay people now and with heterosexual people, but you won't hear it. There's no need for us to use it anymore, no secret language. Mm. Uh, but people do study it, they do degrees in it now. Now, Paul Baker, Lancaster University, um, he went to uh, liaise with a very strange religious order of sisters called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. I don't think they were a real uh, <laughs> uh, religious order, but with their help, he produced a Bible in the Polari language. So, for example, Duchess Gloria took a rib from the Omi, and from the army, he created the Polony. Alex, like, so it was using female terms to refer to God. So we could say that God is the supreme being. God is not male or female, so it doesn't really matter which you use or if you use any uh, uh, pronoun like that. Uh, we've done our brothel, so shall we go to a nice little cafe? Mm. Please follow me. Before we go, I just want to tell you where we're going. Get a lot of drug dealers and people who mm. are in the sex trade. But it's still early and they tend to come out at night time. If mm. we keep together, we'll be okay. Mm. Please follow me. So we're in Soho. Some people think Soho is something to do with Chinese people. It's not, nothing to do with that. The original Chinatown was in Limehouse, um, uh, where Canary Wharf is, uh, and it came here in the 1960s. But Soho, it's called Soho because uh, hundreds of years ago, it was a hunting ground. It was full of uh, uh, marshes and things and fields. And the king used to sit on his horse and he went, Soho, which means let's go. That's why it's called Soho. Now, I'd like you to look to your right at that red building over there. Can you see over there where it's red, red brick? Okay, all of that uh, building there across the road where it's red brick, okay? Now, in the early 1940s, that was known as Sam's Cafe. And Sam's Cafe was a really lively place. It wasn't, people didn't just drink coffee. The thing is that England at that time was a place where you went to work, you went home, you went to the pub, half past ten it closed, you went to bed, that was it, it was like a big village. Soho was the only place that you could count on to have a real good time, you know, at night time. And Sam's Cafe was one of those. Lots of different people went there, there were, um, uh, uh, ethnic minorities, there were people who liked uh, gambling, people who liked drinking a lot, uh, bits of music, and of course there was the LGBT crowd that went there. People just mixed together very happily, you see. I suppose they were all they felt like they were outsiders. So they used to go in there. Now the problem is this area was residential. So you can imagine with all the noise, curtains started twitching, you know, people looking out, seeing every night these people, not just weekends, every night 
until the early hours of the morning. So letters started to go in to the police and to Westminster Council. Now the police had better things to do, you know, catching you know, murderers and robbers and rapists and things like that. But when they got complaints, they had to uh, react to them. The owner decided to do, but that was Sam, he, dis he decided to do what nobody had ever done before, which was to employ a doorman. It was the first place to have a doorman on there. And he said, look, I just want you to catch all the queer people. You know, any man or woman is a bit dressed up like the opposite gender. Just keep them out. They're, they're the main ones. Or we'll get closed down, we see. Now, the problem is the doorman didn't know how to identify gay people. So he thought, he had a word with Sam, mm, you know, what do they, how do I identify them? No, do they wear um, a red tie? That was one. Gay people wear red tie. Lesbians, do they wear pink shoes? We're not sure. Do, do, do they wear uh, um, coloured clothing? Or do they wear black and white? What do they, I had no idea who was gay. So what happened? He was turning away the wrong people. So in the end, it was full of gay people, all having a good time. You see. And the party went on, even worse. So in the end, uh, Westminster Council got together, the Prime Minister gave them special powers to close it down. But this went on for about 10 years, actually, Sam's Cafe. Now, I just want to turn you... Oh, my goodness. Let's go down here. OK, do you want to move back? Just move back. So the White Horse, what's happened? When they closed it down, there was a migration of people that just moved down the street to the White Horse in the early 50s. So the thing is, what I need to say is that, you know, those days there were no internet. You were not allowed to advertise to say, we've moved down to the White Horse. There was no way of publicising it, it was illegal to do that. But somehow people would know there was a grapevine. Whenever there was a migration of, from one gay place to another, people would just know, just like that. And they came down here. And the landlord thought, oh my God, I've got them now. So he went straight to the police and told them. And the police didn't want to know, they just ignored him. Not them again, you know, you'll have to have them. So what he did, he said, right, I'll employ a doorman. So he employed a doorman. What do gay people wear? Do they wear red ties? Do lesbians wear pink shoes? Do they wear different coloured clothing? Mm. Do they carry handbags, you know? Same old thing. So guess what happened? He was turning away the wrong people. <laughs> and it became full of gay people again. And uh, so, uh, basically, the police closed it down and it went under new management. Okay. So that was Sam's Cafe and the White Horse, and there were many places uh, like that in Soho. I just want to point out also on your left hand side, Archer Street, mm. was also at gay places there. Uh, there was a gay bar which I think is closed down, and there was also an organisation called Kairos which had a gay Buddhist group and people could meditate. So there is something for everybody in the LGBT community, you're Buddhist or Christian, uh, Muslim or, or, you know, whatever. There's always somewhere that you can go around. Here. So we've done our 24-hour drinking club. Hope you enjoyed that. We've done our yep. brothel, we've done uh, our cafe, and we've done our pub. Let's relax now and go to a really nice cottage. Please follow me. I'd like you to look to your left to look up there where I'm pointing. Can you see that clock? Where it says Costumia. Costumia. Yeah. And it says Wonky Restaurant. Well, if we go back a few decades, it was actually a shop which produced costumes for the theatre. And it was run by a man whose surname was Clarkson. And it was known as Clarkson's Costumia. Look now to your Right, down here, there was a big cast iron urinal and it was known to those who visited it as Clarkson's Cottage.
Now, this was a place, it's gone now, but this was a place where uh, gay men, or usually married men, there might be gay men who got married, they might be bisexual, would come to meet other men. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say that it wasn't just gay people who got lonely. Heterosexual people also were not allowed to show affection in public. That would also be something that the police would uh, find very offensive. It would be public disorder. Heterosexuals would have to show their affection in secret. Now, if you were gay or bisexual or man, there was nowhere that you could go, you see. Uh, because of this, what's happened is that there were lots of places, secret places like urinals, there were tunnels, there were back streets, graveyards even, anywhere where it was possible people would meet. And if you could just hand me that book please. And I just want to show you a picture. It was such a uh, big practice that even a map was drawn up here. This is part of central London and includes Soho of all the cottages, meaning public toilets, that you could visit. So that's actually had a map uh, drawn up there. Uh, this, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to advertise a book. It's called Queer London anyway. Uh, it's very interesting, thank you. Now, the problem was that a lot of people who came here were black males and blackmailers. There were also what's called the pretty police. The police would have a policy, plainclothes police would pretend to be get there and they would go in there. All they would have to do is say hello, you say hello back, that's it. You would, that, was it that was enough, you see. And uh, between the wars in the 1920s, there was even a man who came down here who was blackmailed for £100,000. Well, you can imagine, £100,000 is a lot of money now. Mm. 100 years ago, it'd be worth millions. So mm. even very influential people, he might have been in the House of Lords, wanted to keep secret. We don't know. Um, anyway, what's happened is that the magistrates' courts were getting more and more and more of these uh, uh, men being brought by the police. And many of them, the magistrate would just say, look, you only said hello to him, he said hello. I'm throwing this case out. Lots of cases were thrown out because there was no real evidence that the person was uh, picking up or anything like that. One magistrate got so exasperated, he said, I wish somebody would just blow the bloody places up and get rid of them. But there was one magistrate in particular who made a speech about it. And I'll just read it to you now. Urinals have a certain odour which excites queer men. When it's been cleaned and disinfected, they won't go anywhere near it. But once the smell of cleanliness is gone, they're back working themselves up into a frenzy on heat. Like the bitch, once they have the scent of urine, urine there's no holding them back. Charming, isn't it? saying things like that and speeches like that led to a view that people who went in there were disgusting degrading and vile not always the case very small minority imagine anybody liking the smell of urine they were the kind of fables put around by about gay men nowadays there's a more balanced approach, uh, senior police officers, you know, when they're organising the training, uh, try to strike a, a balance between the right to be intimate with the right for the public not to be shot. And that goes for heterosexuals. So whether cottaging has now uh, um, less frequent or not, I don't know. I can't, I can't say anything about that. But this one, it was pulled down after the war in 1945. And what's happened mm -hmm. to it? There was a, an American millionaire and he bought it from Westminster County. And he took it back to 
to his home in the USA and it's now in his back garden where he sits ah, there well, looking at well. it lovingly with lots of happy memories. So that, that's, that's a nice finish. Okay, right, so now we're going on to a really, really noisy place where you can have a really good time. So if you fancy that, please follow me. It's that pub over there, okay? Now, in the 1930s, opened in 1935, it was known as London's Miniature Harlem. It's a place where you could tap the night away. It attracted so many types, especially most of them were Afro-Americans. So it was a place uh, which was frequented more by black people. It was also a place where they mixed with all kinds of people. Uh, people liked to have a drink, they liked to have a dance. People loved this music uh, from Harlem, you know, it was kind of real toe-tapping. Now, it was called the Shim Sham Club. And it's called the Shim Sham Club. Shim Sham, Shim Sham Shimmy was a kind of music and dance uh, all the way from Harlem. And if you've not heard it before, it went something like this. One, a two, a one, two, three, four. We're going to do the Shim Sham. Come on, baby, we're going to do the Shim Sham. Come on, honey, we're going to do the Shim Sham. So I can Shim Sham with you. Go and do the shim sham. You know you wanna? Go and do the shim sham. Why do you wanna? Go and do the shim sham. So I can shim sham with you. Shim sham shim me through the night. Shim sham baby, hold me tight. Shim sham shimmy, I love you. Shim sham baby, do you love me too? So we're going to the shim sham. Come on baby, go and do the shim sham. Come on honey, go and do the shim sham. So I can shim sham with you. Mm. Now you can see why they didn't let me join the choir. No, I can't hear from my voice. Now, this was so noisy, four o'clock in the morning, not just weekends, every morning. So the complaints went in there. And uh, some of them were quite funny. Uh, one man said uh, in his letter, it's a price and a, a, a den of price and iniquity. He said a rendezvous for homosexual perverts. The practice of black and white intercourse. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Terrible, isn't it? Now, he went back there, he went twice, so he must have enjoyed it. And he says that he went down into the basement, there was a gambling club there, and he had his wallet stolen. And he said, please. We need you to close this place down as soon as possible. Signed, uh, pro bono public. That means for the good of the public. Anyway, police weren't that bothered, but as I say, they had to respond to it. Otherwise, they would have complained to their member of parliament. But the noise went on, nobody seems to be bothered. So the police went in there, and what they tried to do, is they tried to close the place down on the basis that there was out of hours drinking. You've been drinking after 11 o'clock, you see. You're not allowed to do that. They said we've even looked at the menu. I'll show you the menu in here, if I can find it. Shim Sham Cabaret. It's got the lobster beak, prawn cocktail, um, oxtail soup, um, creme fraiche, everything you want to eat, but it doesn't say anything about alcohol. Mm. They said you haven't even got it on the menu. And they said, no, no, we're not breaking the law because there isn't a bar. Mm. People bring their own bottle and there's no law against them. So people are bringing their own bottle and the law says you're not allowed to drink beyond the bar hours. Well, there is no bar, so we're not breaking it. So it went on and on like that. But eventually, people couldn't stand the noise anymore. Well, people who were miserable couldn't stand the noise anymore. Mm. And the police got special powers to close it down in that same year, 1935. Mm. Now, what's happened then? It's opened as another club called the Rainbow Roof under new management. But guess what? <laughs> same music. Same people, same everything, black and white intercourse, men dancing with men, 
women dancing with women, all races, and Jewish people, political agitators, the whole lot were in there, and eventually it was closed down. I don't know what it was afterwards, but from 1952 to 1969, it was a flamingo club, which was uh, Britain's uh, version of uh, rhythm and blues and, uh, and, and jazz music. Uh, Britain's answer to Harlem, you see. And it was very popular, it never got closed down, there was no, no problem there at all. And maybe I could uh, find some photos of famous people who, who, who played and sang there, if I can find them. Let me see. Uh, yeah, there's one. There's Garland Wilson. He was uh, mm. a, a queer black American. Mm. And he played there at the open in, when it opened in 1935. Mm. Garland Wilson. Uh, someone else. Uh, Elizabeth, oops, Elizabeth Welsh, American, mm. Afro-American uh, singer and an actress. Mm. She said, I love Soho, it's full of the fantastic places. I love visiting, I love going there. Mm. Very, very popular, mm. very happy place. But it's up to close. Okay, so what have we done so far then? We've done all these places, we've done the cottage, We've done uh, uh, the Shim Sham Club and mm. I really enjoyed it. So now mm. I think we should be good and go to church, don't you? Church. Please follow me.